Welcome to another Message in a Minute. Today we are talking about what is your approach to ministry? Is it to build up or to build out? That's what we're, that's the question. And you ask me, ask, okay, what am I talking about? Well, you know, it seems as man, we've always had this desire to build things up, whether it's towers, whether it's buildings, you go to cities, you see towers and statues and everything. When, as I, you know, as I read the Bible, interpret it, and as we talk about the church, God has always wanted us to build out. Uh, and we're going to get into that as we go through this. We're going to look at uh, everything from the Old Testament, start with the Old Testament, Genesis, going to go through uh, the Gospels and I also look at revelations of, of, well, of what I'm talking about. Okay, but so, so to talk about the... Uh, this, this process of ministerial leadership, that is the best place to go, I think, is really to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11 through 13, because that's really where we get a lot of uh, the foundational background for what we're talking about. You see, in Ephesians, Paul uh, writes this. He says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And what we've done, I think, um, man, we always have this desire to build up, and we've taken this organizational structure and we've made it vertical uh, in many cases. What do we mean by that? Is that we've kind of stacked them. We've got teachers at the bottom, pastors, we're evangelists, and if you, you know, kind of go up that hierarchical chain, you become a prophet, and at the top of the stack is an apostle. And then, you know, then God, you know, speaks down through all those to get to the people or the body of Christ. Uh, yeah, but how my interpretation is a little bit different because if you keep reading that chapter of, of those verses, he tells you why uh, these were given to the church. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, when I look at it from that perspective, to me, that's not a vertical organizational structure or a chain of command. To me, that is more of a horizontal or build out. I mean, really, it's a flat line organization because in the center of that, you have the people. And then when you look around on that circle, all of those positions, whether it's prophets, whether it's evangelists or apostles or teachers or, or pastors, they're all there to support, to edify, to perfect, to build up the body of Christ. And it wasn't made so that the people have to run this gauntlet you know, as you see here, to get to God, but no, so that God could commune and fellowship with the, with, the, with the body of Christ through the help and support of the ministerial staff. But many times now, we've kind of reversed that to where the people is having to feed the machine. They're having to feed this, 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 this structural, this structure uh, to, and have to do all these things just to get to God. Now, you say, what do I base this on? I say, what? So let's start back. Let's go back to Genesis, because you know me, I love Genesis. If you watch my other message in a minute, I always like to go back to the beginning. Now, in the beginning, this is in Genesis 1, 28, God gave man a command, a commandment. You say, he gave commandments in Genesis? Yes. Commandments didn't just start in the book of Exodus. They started long, long before. Yes, there was a commandment. He said, God commanded, he told, he told man to be fruitful multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves out on the earth. Now, what does that mean? Yes, to go out, to go out and, and take, take dominion, have dominion of the earth. But Satan comes along a little bit later on, as he always does, using trickery, deceit, deception. <clears throat> In Genesis 3.5, he distorts this commandment by tempting man uh, through pride to disobey God and try to show him another way of having dominion. How? Well, just like he, he said in, uh, in Genesis 3, chapter, five, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, he told Eve, he said, if you eat of this tree, you will become as gods. You can elevate self-elevation. You can elevate yourself up. As God, when that was never the command that God gave, He said to go out, subdue. When you have to, to subdue something, you go out. To be fruitful in multiplication, multiply, multiplication spreads out. Seed, seeds go out. And then the body of Christ grows from that. So in the beginning, 
God's uh, plan was always to go out. Satan, through pride, through lust, through deceit, had us to start to self-elevate ourselves and to try to become as gods. So what did God have to do? Kind of refocus man's misguided effort by banishing them from the garden. And what does that mean? He had to send them out. And we'll see this pattern over and over where God has to send us out, continually sending us out when we continually want to build up. Okay, so let's look at the Tower of Babel, all right? So you see, after the flood, Noah's descendants began to spread out over the earth, which, and that was good. That's what, that was kind of the plan, go out. But as the people start to move towards the east, they decide to settle down in, in the plain of Sinar, and this is what they said. Listen, go to, let us build a city and what? And a tower. Do we think tower? Building up. Whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now you see, the very thing that God was asking or demanding a man to do to go out, this is the very thing that we that kicked against. Meaning that we don't want to be scattered. We want to stay here and make us a name. And to make a name for ourselves, meaning that we want to be elevated. Here again, starting to build up. And if we remember what God had to do, because their desire was to build up, not out, he had to scatter them. He tore down the tower, confused the language, and had them go out again. Here again, another example of going out. Even when we think about the tabernacle in uh, the book of Exodus, as well as Hebrews. See, God gave Moses the design of the tabernacle, and he patterned it after the things that were in heaven. You see, in the tabernacle was to be a place for God to come and to be in fellowship with his people and for Israel to be an example for the nations, for all the Gentile nations around. Israel was to be that example, meaning that they were going to spread out and bring people in fellowship with God. But the design was never to build up. But through disobedience, idolatry, vanity, all these things, it caused God to have to send with Israel into slavery because they became disobedient and they became very self-centered in their worship. Now, what did God do with slavery? Now, this is probably a touchy subject for some of us because we know how we are when we use the, the slavery word. But see, God used slavery throughout history many times to achieve his objectives. And even in this case, he used the vehicle of slavery or used slavery as a vehicle to get his word out to the Gentile nations. Why did I say that? Because you think about this. Whenever Israel went to captivity, if you read, uh, there were great prophets who rose up out of that slavery. But as a matter of fact, Daniel. Daniel was a product of slavery. Uh, you think about Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of these. These, these great men that we quote, that, we, that we, we revere as great prophets, but those ministries were born out of slavery, meaning while Israel was in slavery, while Judah was in, was in captivity, that's when these great prophets rose up and spoke great things. And in the process of doing that, the word of God was spread to where places like Nineveh or Babylon, Persia, all the great kingdoms of the world got, was, received the word of God through, by Israel going into slavery. Okay? Does that make sense? Hmm. I know. You're probably thinking, never thought about slavery that way before. Well, hmm. Maybe we have to rethink the old way we've been thinking. Okay. So now let's move up. Let's move into the temple. I'll go into the, the, uh, uh, the, to the gospels. You see, in the, the gospel, the temple leadership, here again, and, and if you think about the temple, that's where, you know, it, it was the center of worship. It was the center of commerce uh, for Israel and all those things. But what had happened um, the temple leadership had, had built great buildings, and they had, again, built another large organizational structure that was become very oppressive on the people, meaning they had built this thing up. They had Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and, and uh, the Sanhedrin and the high, really uh, that whole hierarchy, again, uh, that was, should have been there to serve the people, to serve the body of Christ now, but had become a vertical organization that now the body of Christ was having to feed them to keep this machine going, to keep this, 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 tab this temple organization running. See, even in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 24 and 2, Jesus says to his disciples, See ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, 
There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Meaning that all of this, this, this hierarchy that we see, this, this, these buildings and all these things, it's going to be flatlined. It's going to be completely redone. Not only the physical uh, architecture, but also the spiritual architecture. Now, you see, because in the temple, when Jesus was crucified, when he was hanging on the cross, if you remember, the veil in the temple was torn, was torn into, into, into two pieces. And that signified a fundamental, or a monumental, maybe I should say, a fundamentally monumental. I don't know if I can put those two words together or not, but I think you get my point. A, a change in the way, the, in, the, in the established hierarchy of the temple. Because at that point, the, the Levitical priesthood, was pretty much out of business. Yeah. The, the ironic, all those things from Exodus, Jesus said that, that signified a new beginning or the new testament or the new covenant. So that hierarchy was now out of business. And, 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 and really what happened, he flatlined the church organization. Now everyone has access. We no longer have to go through the high priest and through all of these wickets to get to God because now everybody has free access. So, and, and that even carried forward into the book of Acts when we look at the early or the New Testament church. Uh, the book of Acts implemented the great commission that Jesus gave. He told them to what? Go ye therefore. When you hear the word therefore, what does that mean? It don't mean to stay in one place. It means you've got to go out. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go out and even... Before Jesus, in the book of Acts, before Jesus ascended back into heaven, uh, he gave a, another decree to build out. He says what? But ye shall receive power, and after that the Holy Ghost is coming to you, and ye will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's Acts 1 and 8. Meaning that sending them out, meaning that you're not going to stay here. We started here in uh, Jerusalem, but you're moving out. You're gonna, the gospel is going to be spread to the uttermost parts of the earth. Continue to spread the thing out. So now, when we look at the modern day church, you know, the modern era church, you know, and, and, and if, the, if you've read the book of Acts, you know, there was a lot of power. There was a lot of spirit. There was a lot of anointing, a lot of fellowship in, in, in the book of Acts as, as the young church started to grow. But like everything else, over time, you know, the, the, the carnal nature of man, we kind of step in and, and kind of take over again. So the human desires kicked in for us to do what? Build up again. So a lot of the small in-home congregations gave way to large cathedrals. And here again, another top-heavy organizational structure that became what? A bigger burden on the people. So after that, what did God have to do again? You know, he sends another young man by the name of Martin Luther who cried out against some of these practices. And with that, there were two major points that Martin Luther used to spark what's known as the Protestant Reformation. First, he said the Bible is the central religious authority. And second, we receive salvation by faith and not by deeds, not by works. But over a matter of time, even uh, with the, after the Protestant Reformation, there became various denominations started to do the same thing, build up again. You know, whether you're Baptist or Methodist, or Episcopalian, whatever, we've all started to have these organizational structures. Doesn't mean that we don't need organization, but we have to be careful with the layers when we start layering too many things on the top. Now, even, but I love it when we go to the book of Revelations. Because when, when John is talking in the book of Revelation, it really, to me, gives us a, a holistic design of, of the eternal church. Because the scene that, that John portrays is, is really the, the ultimate view of a flatline organization. Okay, in chapter 21, what, verse 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. You see, there we go. We have the body of Christ, we have God, and just a flat line organization. No, no middlemen, no, no hierarchy. And also in that uh, same chapter, but verse 22, he says, And I saw no temple therein. You catch that? No temple. There was no need for these, these organizations. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So this thing that we keep trying to build up, and when we get to heaven, it's flatline. 
It's flatline. No temple. Because who the temple is God. It's the Lamb himself. So, with that said, I know we said a lot. So what is your approach to ministry when you think about it? Whatever you're doing uh, for the body of Christ. Are you building up? Are you building hierarchical structures? Are you building organizations that go up? Or are you building out where you have servants who are serving the body of Christ and letting the word of God go out? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He that has an ear.